So let's, let's start talking about essential biodiversity variables. And I've already given you an introduction to them. Okay, you remember this, is a, this was intended as kind of a means by which biodiversity could have a common currency, a common set of variables, so that data could be communicated and, and compared and syntheses developed. Um, I showed you this, this diagram and it shows, you know, kind of primary observations being abstracted slightly or synthesized slightly into these six sets of essential biodiversity variables. And then from there, all sorts of synthetic things. Okay? And the synthetic things could be kind of as, as low level as immediate individual policy decisions or global syntheses and global uh, changes to how things are done. So essentially what we're talking about is you know, these are actual data that get taken. The essential biodiversity variables are a first level of, of um, kind of organizing the data. And then we have all sorts of uh, derivative products. So this is just to remind you, but we have these six sets of variables. Each one of them includes several kinds of, you know, sub kinds of variables. So if we talk about uh, species populations, well, that could be the existence of a population, be it big or be it small, or it could be um, population in the sense of numbers of individuals. Okay, so all I'm trying to do is to kind of remind you of the six bio essential biodiversity variables and in a way give you kind of a plan for the next couple of days, okay? Essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna take each one of these variables and talk about it in detail, talk about what is it? It sounds simple, but it's not usually. Um, but also what do we have in hand, which is to say what exists for that variable and also what are the sources because you may need to uh, look for population data across your country or whatever, okay? But this is, these are these variables that ideally we would have access to for the whole earth, okay? Any questions kind of remembering back to the introduction to EBVs that I gave you earlier? Questions? Thank you. Uh, for this uh, six uh, uh, essential biodiversity uh, functions that we are considering together, so if we are conducting a research, for example, um, do we have to combine all of them, or we can take one and go deep <laughs> under those <laughs> small points? For example, if we talk about Ecosystem structure, this habitat structure, ecosystem extent fragmentation, ecosystem compo co composition by functional type, mm -hmm. something like that. There's no requirement at all. The, these are simply, you know, imagine we have billions upon billions of, of primary data records. Mm -hmm. This is a way of kind of categorizing them. Mm -hmm. And so for a given study, you may only need genetic data or you may only be interested in ecosystem structure and ecosystem function, mm -hmm. okay? But this is just kind of an organization thing. Mm -hmm. Now, it's getting fed into policy, and we're gonna talk about that later on, mm -hmm. but no, you, as, a, as an individual researcher, you use what you're interested in. Mm -hmm. You may have to add other things, but you use whatever is, is useful or, or meaningful to the task that you're taking on. Yeah. So, uh, by diverse, uh, essential by, by diverse variables, are they limited absolutely on these ones? Or <laughs> so, so, because we have a six right. there, right. and uh, under each group, there are also some, right. some there's, there's, there's no limitation. Okay. okay, nobody is saying these are the only six. Okay. 
But what these are, are these are the six that the big policy platforms are using as their six priorities. And so if there were something about, I mean, I don't see um, biodiversity human interactions, right? That might be an interesting one, and it's really not there, right? That might be a seventh, but it's not on their list. Yeah. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> yes, Emmanuel. Yes. Uh, just related to that, ecosystem function, how does it differ from ecosystem service? Uh, so how does ecosystem function differ from an ecosystem service? Well, remember, um, we defined ecosystem services as essentially providing something free of charge to humans. And a lot of those ecosystem functions may have nothing to do with humans. So I think ecosystem services is saying out of these ecosystem functions, these are the ones that benefit humans. Okay, so if someone says nutrient retention is one of the ecosystem services, then he or she is wrong. Well, no, because nutrient retention may be a very valuable thing to humans. Uh, if you have heavy erosion because of degraded habitats, um, then the, the soil may become unusable for, for farming. But that's a material benefit for humans. It's also, nu nutrient retention is also a, an ecosystem function. So it's essentially, it, it's two different lists that can overlap but neither has to include all of the other. Okay? Yeah. Other questions? Uh, actually, um, I, I was confused. Uh, I was going to ask if we have six essential biodiversity variables. I was going to ask other variables which are not essential. So are there variables that are not essential? Yes, of course. But um, that word essential makes them sound very, very important. And I don't think anybody would argue that these are six important dimensions of biodiversity. They are not the only ones, and they are not necessarily the six most important ones. This is a list that was developed by committees of experts, but that doesn't mean it's right, and it certainly doesn't mean that it is universally applicable. For something that you're working with, you may need two other dimensions that aren't on the list, and one or two of these dimensions may be unimportant. But this, this, was, this was a list that was developed mostly to guide policy and guide um, data, um, data, how do I say it? Guide efforts to organize data for serving, you know, for making data available. Sure. Okay? Yeah. So these variables, these ecosystem, sorry, these essential biodiversity variables are not in any order. The only organization that we've given to them is that we put the two that can be measured globally and conveniently via remote sensing, we put those two at the end. Um, so we have five that are not generally able to be measured easily, globally, quickly, and efficiently, okay? And then we have two where smart people with satellites can make you maps of at least some of those dimensions pretty quickly, okay? So let's talk first about genetic composition. This is just one of these essential biodiversity variables. And it's the idea that we would have a picture globally of the genetic composition of individuals and populations of all species present at every site around the world, okay? 
obviously it's an impossible proposition. But let's talk about it a bit. Okay? It, it's, it's less impossible than maybe it seems. Anybody know what that is? An elephant, no, but it could be. <laughs> I'll give you a clue, this is in Scotland. Anybody know about the Loch Ness Monster? Okay, this is probably the most famous picture of the Loch Ness Monster. What is it? God only knows, right? But it's been centuries that occasional sightings like this uh, have occurred and it's just been this mystery to the point where they uh, they took submarines into Loch Ness um, kind of each new technology they've they've tried to monitor this place so very recently this came out in the news this um, team from University of Otago uh, took environmental samples from Loch Ness. They just collected water and sediment and things like that. And then they just sequenced all the DNA that they could find. It's called environmental genomics. And what they find is no evidence that it was a plesiosaur, uh, no evidence of an otter or a seal, uh, no evidence of a giant crocodile or very large fish like sturgeon. Uh, but they have found evidence of uh, eels. And so they're wondering if this might not be a giant eel. Okay? But it's an interesting application of this idea of having a good idea of the genomics of everything, you know, in this case vertebrates, and putting that to use to solve a, an interesting question. This isn't solved, but now they can focus on eels and see what, what they find or don't find. Here's another example. And this is, this is a pretty neat one. Six shark species identified by sequencing their DNA from seawater. So the shark, just by being there and probably, you know, losing some skin tissue or, or excreting, leaves some DNA behind. And there, there's some neat things in here. Um, large species are often no longer detected in habitats where they formerly occurred, but it's unclear as to whether this apparent missing diversity of megafauna is a consequence of the species no longer being there, or just being really rare or really shy and never getting seen. And so what they did was they used traditional s techniques. So they used underwater visual censuses and baited videos essentially underwater camera traps. And they, and all around New Caledonia, I hope I included a map, because, yeah, I did, because um, it's a pretty spectacular sampling. But they sampled sites all the way around New Caledonia using these traditional methods. And then they also went in and just took samples of seawater, amplified all the DNA, looked for DNA that was shark-like, and then tested that DNA to see what it was similar to, okay? And this, this environmental genomics approach detects 44% more, 44 more shark species than the combination of the traditional techniques. So here, here's what their results look like. Look at the sampling, okay? That's pretty cool, that's a lot of samples. Um, that's New Caledonia, here's Australia, and it's off the coast. And um, you can see the sample size uh, for visual censuses, uh, cameras, and eDNA. And what you can see is that wasn't a lot of work, right? 
uh, and then the numbers of species detected, uh, 9, 9, and 13. And so anyhow, it's, it's quite interesting. This is another interesting graphic because you see shark diversity per sample. And so you can see most of the visual censuses detected nothing or one. And the camera traps more, but the eDNA tended to get at least two, more than two, on average, per sample. And then here you can see how the different species of sharks, those six up there, were only found using eDNA, using environmental genomics. And the other techniques got, got subsets. Okay? So that's, that's really interesting. That, that's kind of promising. Right? It's the idea that you can go to a really remote place or in the Loch Ness thing, a really diverse set of possibilities and you can get amazing amounts of information just out of water or soil or, you know. So that's, that's pretty interesting. And then the other crucial element is look at the costs involved. This is the cost per human genome. Humans have a pretty big genome, okay? In 1990, it cost $3 billion. That's $3,000 million. It's a lot of money. And now, well, this is 2012, two weeks and $1,000. In 2019, it's even less. So, Back 20 years, this was something that was only done for humans. It was considered a, a mega science project. Um, and now it's not. Now it's something that you can take a little swab out of your cheek and send off, and they sequence a decent portion of your genome. So this is, this is, this is another element that's very, very promising. You could imagine a full genome for every species on Earth within a decade or two. It's not out of the realm of possibilities. So the databases that, um, that store these data have grown very, very rapidly. Um, the biggest, I believe, is GenBank, which is run by uh, the U.S. government, but there's one in, in Europe, there's one in Japan, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? We'll come back to those and you guys will have an opportunity to get out and check what is available from, from your countries. Um, it's interesting. I played a little bit with it. So let's go into GenBank. And I uh, just found some summary tables. So GenBank has nucleotide sequences for 420,000 formally described species. And there's probably, what, 1.8 million described and probably another 8 to 18 million undescribed. Um, if you look at, this is the, the um, Annual percent increase, mammals, not humans, plants, I'm looking for interesting ones, primates, rodents, and you can see the annual percent increase, 0.3% for primates, 2.9%, for plants, 37%, and for other mammals, I think that's 60%. And then I, I really couldn't find summary, you know, good summaries of, of um, what's in GenBank. But if you look at which organisms have more, more sequences associated, the winner is Homo sapiens. 19 billion base pairs sequenced. Um, Mus musculus ratus norwegicus bostaris. And then we go into Zia maize, so corn, Suscrofa, and then we get into 
perhaps a little bit more interesting organisms. But even for those, everything on this list has more than a billion sequence, well, base pairs sequenced and on GenBank. So it's a massive amount of information. And so you can imagine that this could be the raw material for uh, getting a view of what is, what is the genetic makeup of every species. It doesn't necessarily get us the genetic makeup of every place, right? I looked and looked and looked for a phylogeny with densities of um, sequences painted on the phylogeny. That would be really fun to see. I couldn't find one. This is the best that I could find. It's essentially a pie split up by numbers of sequences in GenBank, and it's 10 years old. And really the only real take home here is that plants, mammals, and out of mammals, rodents are kind of the big winners um, because EST is expressed sequence tags. HTG is high throughput genomic, which they're not breaking out by taxa. And GSS is genome survey sequences. But things that are, are identified by taxon, uh, it looks like mammals and plants 